Lecture 3 Creation Myths In our first two lectures, we looked at such terms as myth and mythography and mythology, and we also did a, a kind of a setting up of some analytical tools that we can use to look for our own meanings in the myths that we'll take a look at. And then in the last lecture, we mapped out the entire course, so we have a sort of bird's eye view of where, as, as Dr. Zeus says, it, of all the places that we'll go and the things that we'll see. In this one, I want to do three things. First is to sort of define the genre of creation myth, setting up some expectations for us. Um, what, what do we look for? What do we expect from creation myths? Secondly, to, to talk a little bit about a taxonomy or a classification system that we'll be using in this course to divide up the various kinds of myths that we'll look at. And then third, to take some examples, look at some examples of Egyptian creation myths to illustrate how these definitions and taxonomies work. The technical term for creation story is really cosmogony, which is derived from two Greek words meaning beginning and order. So that creation stories really are about the beginning of order. Typically in creation stories, um, there is a pre-existing god or gods whose existence is not very often explained or accounted for very much. And then there's also some kind of pre-existing matter, some kind of chaos, something that exists along with this pre-existing God. Thus, the first, very first two verses in the book of Genesis is fairly typical about the way these kind of creation stories work. The first two verses read, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Here, there is a pre-existing God, there is also pre-existing matter, and what God does initially is to create light, but then once he creates light, what mostly he does after that is simply divide up that pre-existing matter. Um, light from dark, water from land, water from water, and so what's initially muddled and confused and divided becomes ordered, becomes structured, and that's what creation stories really do. If we ask ourselves what kind of questions do creation stories try to answer, we can let uh, Clyde Ford in his book The Hero with an African Face give us a list of things that he thinks are really important for creation stories. First is, how is order established out of chaos? How does the chaos give way to order? How does the one, the undifferentiated unity, break into the many? How does the unmanifest become manifest? Once the circle is open, how is it closed again? How does from moving from unity into differentiation, how does that differentiation give its way back to unity? How does the plenitude return back to the void? These are some of the questions that creation stories typically try to address. In human terms, the question is really the same question, that is, how does individual human life, how does my consciousness emerge from the mysterious mystery preceding it, and then how does it again dissolve back via death back into that unknown. As we've said, in so many ways we'll discover in these creation myths that the individual creation story and the cosmic creation story have amazing parallels between them. But we also know if these are some of the big questions that, that creation myths try to answer, we also know that myths are multivalenced. Um, Doty's toolkit back in the first lecture reminded us that there are many, many different questions we can ask of myths. From the 19th century on, we've known that myths are functional in that they reaffirm a culture's values and practices. Many of the things that a culture believes get written into these creation myths and then fed back so they reinforce values that the culture already believes. Uh, the people of Timor in the uh, eastern Indonesia myth in which there was a huge vagina that appeared out of the ground and then creepers came out and then people climbed out of the creepers. As they go on to explain this myth, the very first people to emerge on those creepers became the ancestors of the landowners and aristocrats. Those who came out later became the tenants and the commoners. So that here we see how a creation myths are set up in a certain way to sort of justify the way things are. 
There is another similar story in China, Nu Kua, who in some versions of the story is given credit for creating the first human beings, starts out by making them individually. She shapes each, each human being out of yellow clay by hand and then brings them to life. It was a slow process and she got bored with it after a while, so eventually to kind of speed up the process, she simply dragged a cord through the mud and every time a piece of mud flew off, it became a human being. This is a much quicker way of, of inventing. But again, as the Chinese later on came to understand this story, they understood that those hand-crafted yellow clay people were the ancestors of the aristocrats and those people, those mud people who just came little, little pieces of mud flying off the cord became commoners. Um, and we know that we remember that many Greeks traced their ancestry back to a god. These are kings and warriors particularly who trace their ancestry back to a god, usually Zeus, in order to justify their perks, to, to justify why they had everything and other people had nothing. These are some of the ways in which values get built into creation myths. We know that the Sumerians and the Babylonians believed that human beings were made as the servants of the god, of the gods. It, the idea was the gods found the work that they had to do irksome and bothersome and wearisome, and so eventually they invent human beings to take the load off, to, to do the heavy lifting, to do the, the sweaty work. And so the Sumerians and Babylonians had the sense that they were servants. That's what they'd been created for. In the Hebrew story and in some others, the, the Mayan creation myth that we've already looked at and we'll look at more closely again, humans are created as lords of creation. That is, everything else was done for human beings, and human beings come along as the kind of star on top of the Christmas tree and are given dominion over everything that's been created. And here's another way in which values can be built into creation stories. You'd feel differently if you thought you had been invented as a servant as opposed to being invented or created as a master. So that in, in all these ways, what we see is that values are built into and around creation myths. Barbara Sproul, in a, in a book called uh, Primal Myths, um, says that myths are integral parts of religion, that every religion has a myth as its center some way, which defines a central reality, and then a whole structure of values is built around that reality and in relation to it. As she puts it in her book, whatever the range and depth of individual myths, they are still concerned with creation, with the relations of death to life, non-existence to existence, not being to being. Whether the myth addresses the issue of creation in its broadest sense as the origin of all being, or in its narrowest sense as the origin of a particular being, the same mystery is central, the nature of reality itself. And so what creation myths do in a way is define that reality, which then allow a whole series of valuations and values to be built around that. Mertzea Eliad says that creation myths always establish what he calls an axis mundi, that is a world axis, a place where, as we mentioned in our last lecture, a place where the human and the, prof or the, human and the divine worlds, the, the divine and the profane worlds intersect. So that when we go back to an axis mundi, whether that's a particular place or something else, we are going back to the place where those original forces that organized, that created our world in the first place, are still present. And it gives us contact to these moments with sacred time. The Egyptians, for example, tried to identify that mound of earth that first emerged from the primal waters, and they tried to define that as an axis mundi. Build a temple on top of that, and every time you go back there, you come back into contact with the forces that created the universe in the first place. But, as, as uh, Eliad points out, an axis mundi can be almost anywhere. It doesn't have to be um, a sacred site where something happened. It can be a rock, it can be a tree, it can be a mountaintop, it can be a temple. As he says, and I think this is a really beautiful definition, you'll see the relevance of this to creation stories in just a moment, but he says, defining an axis mundi, for a believer, and he's talking about churches here, he says, for a believer, the church shares in a different space from the street in which it stands. The door that opens on the interior of the church actually signifies a solution of continuity. The threshold that separates the two spaces also indicates the distance between two modes of being, the profane and the religious. The threshold is the limit 
the boundary, the frontier that distinguishes and opposes two worlds, and at the same time, the paradoxical place where those worlds communicate, where passage from the profane to the sacred world becomes possible. That's what an axis mundi does. Um, it means also that because each creation story itself is an axis mundi, a place where the power of creation is brought down into profane time, it means that every creation story for almost every early people is thus also sacramental. It's an outward and visible sign of an inner truth of an individual culture, and every creation myth itself is a kind of breakthrough of the sacred into time. Origin myths give us so many powerful things to understand and believe about ourselves. They provide us with our reason for being, the source of our significance, uh, which is why they're so often used to help individuals or a social order regain its health. Creation stories are used over and over again in healing ceremonies that are designed simply by hearing that creation story to put yourself back in touch with that power that created the universe in the first place. David Leeming, who's the one who, who, um, who's, who's reminded us of this, says this in his The World of Myth. When we are broken, we return to our origins to become whole again, whether on the psychiatrist's couch or in the shaman's hut. So it is that the ancient Sumero-Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, was read aloud at the Babylonian New Year festival. This is to guarantee a good year to bring that power into the new year. And so it is that many curing ceremonies, such as the Navajo and Buddhist sand painting ceremonies, begin with the recitation of the creation myth. The sand painting itself is a mandala, a sacred circle representing creation in its original wholeness. When the patient sits in the sand painting and has the creation myth recited over him by the shaman or medicine man, he is returning to the womb of nature in the hope of being reborn into nature's wholeness, of reenacting the creation myth in his own life. So that these are some of the ways in which creation stories themselves are sacred, are sacramental, and why they, are, they can be used in, in healing ceremonies across the world. In some ways, as Leeming points out, the, the, the idea of the sacred meal um, in the Christian tradition is, a, is the same kind of event in which broken and wounded people come to be made whole again by participating in this power that created the universe in the first place. So that's some of the things that we'll be expecting, that we'll be looking for as we, as we go through and talk about our creation myths. Now taxonomies, how do we divide these creation myths up into, into, into kind of categories that we can actually work with? In uh, Myth and Knowing, um, Scott Leonard and Michael McClure provide a whole bunch of different taxonomies of creation myths. We'll pick out one of them. This one they said was invented initially by Mertzea Eliad and then refined by one of his students, Charles H. Long, and that's summarized by, uh, by Leonard and McClure. They say they divide their taxonomy into five different categories. The first type is the ex nihilo, which means made out of nothing, in which a cosmos is created by thought, idea, or dream. In rarer examples, the cosmos can also be created out of a bodily effluent of a god, like sweat or tears, for example. The second type they listed is the earth diver type, the, the earth diver creation story, in which usually an animal or a lowly creature of some kind is sent to the bottom of the primal sea and is asked to bring up a bit of sand or mud, and that is stretched then to make the entire universe. The third um, category is what they call the breaking up of a primal unity. Um, this can be, as we mentioned earlier, it can be Father Sky lying so closely on top of Mother Earth that the children have no room to breathe. It can be a cosmic egg floating on the water for years until it's broken open. Um, somehow that primal unity has to be broken to make this happen. The fourth kind, the fourth category that they use is the dismemberment of a giant or a monster. We'll run across this one in our next lecture, in the lecture where we deal with uh, Marduk and Tiamat, where Tiamat, the great dragon, is taken apart and her body is used to make the cosmos. We'll run across this again in the Chinese myth of Pan Ku, and we'll run it across it again in the Norse myth of Ymir. In each case in which the body of some giant or monster is taken apart and then the universe is made out of that, that monster. 
Five, the fifth category that, that uh, they list is called the emergence myth. And the emergence myth is when creatures travel from underground chambers, emerging from lowest to next higher to higher to higher to higher, until they finally emerge into this world. In the process, becoming more human-like as they go from one level to the next, the emergence myth. We will illustrate all of these different kinds of myths as we take a look in, our, in the rest of this unit in future lectures, and we'll have a chance to look at them in detail. Now, I would like to um, illustrate what we've talked about so far just with a couple of Egyptian myths. Egyptian mythology makes a special challenge for uh, mythographers and for scholars and readers, partly because Egyptian history lasted for such a long time. It lasted for 3,500 years, during which there were profound changes in circumstance and all of those changes in circumstance gets re get reflected in some way in modifications of the early stories. So when a capital city, for example, changed from Memphis to Thebes, the theology would have to be entirely rewritten to give supremacy to the local gods, to the, to the Theban gods rather than the Memphis gods. Sometimes when this happened, older gods got absorbed by newer ones. Sometimes they got degraded. But at any rate, the new gods always have to be given a chance to show off their stuff to become the supreme gods in the revised pantheon. Because Egyptian religion is also syncretistic, which means that they kept adding things on without necessarily eliminating anything. So many times things just simply got added on. So these stories just grew by accretion. And so that the gods became complicated, more and more complicated as they took on different functions. And sometimes gods actually, who were very different in provenance to begin with, got sort of put together, like Atum and Re were combined at some point to make Atum Re, or Amun and Re were combined to make Amun Re. And so in all of these ways, it's been, it's been a real challenge for Egyptologists to put these stories together. And then finally, there's nothing like a standard edition, like a, a sacred text. Um, there's nothing like the Quran or the Bible for Egyptian mythology. Most Egyptian myths, in fact, never got written out per se in their entirety, but the myths have had to be pieced together by illusions. Everybody seemed to know these stories, and so there was no point in writing them out completely. So illusions are made on tomb walls and coffin texts, and texts that deal with something quite different, and scholars over the years have had to piece these things together to make the myth to put it all together. Um, the one that we'll talk about is the one that's perhaps most frequently referred to. Um, if you're interested in looking at some of the variant versions of this, uh, Raymond Van Over in a book called Sun Songs gives us four different Egyptian myths, creation myths, and then gives us a different provenance chronologically and geographically for each one, and you can take a look at some of the differences. It's an interesting study. Um, the one that we're going to talk about comes from Heliopolis, which was a very important religious center even before the historical times, and then continued on into historical period. Um, this one, this particular myth dates from about 2300 BCE. It's been pieced together primarily from the pyramid texts, which were hymns and spells that were designed to be written on the inside of pyramid walls. According to this myth, what, initi what initially existed was primeval waters, which the Egyptians called Nun. Um, Nun later on became the father of all the gods. Now somehow, out of this formless chaos, this very beginning, somehow Atum is generated. And this is not very clear how this happens. Either Atum is self-generated or the waters themselves in some ways produce um, Atum. Um, Atum was later identified with that primeval mound, an Axis Mundi, and the Egyptians tried to discover where that was, which was the first mound that appeared out of the mud, and then build a temple on top of that. And it has been speculated that maybe even the pyramids are efforts to recreate those primal mounds. They at least have something of the same shape. This would have been a natural picture for the Egyptians. Um, who each year, this is a natural way to think of creation, because each year they watched as the, as the Nile flood inundated the plains, and then they would watch when the Nile flood receded, they'd watch for those mounds of earth to appear out of the water, showing above the waters. And for them, that very first, that very first mound appearing out of, the, out of the earth would have been where creation started, and that would have been their real axis mundi. 
Atum, at any rate, whether he's self-generated or produced by the waters, realizes his aloneness and wants other creatures to share with his reality. So he either, in various allusions that we have, he either masturbated or expectorated into existence a brother and sister, Shu and Tefnut. Shu and Tefnut are not really very much anthropomorphized. They aren't, that is, they, they aren't given real personalities and stories and things. They're, it's better for us to think of them, I think, as just natural forces. Shu is like the natural force of air, and Tefnut is something like moisture in the air. They mate to produce Geb and Nut, earth and sky. Um, we've seen this, this is going to be a common theme in creation stories where an earth and sky mate. What gives the Egyptian story just a slightly different twist is that the genders are reversed from what they usually are in other stories. In this case, Nut, the sky, is female, and earth, uh, um, Geb, is male. Usually it's the other way around. Um, and the, the people have tried to guess at why the Egyptians might have done this, why they, why they reverse the genders. And there's several interesting possible explanations. One of them is that in most places, the sky sends down the rain which fertilizes the earth, which made it quite easy for people to think of the sky as male and the earth as female. We remember that back in ancient Egypt, it didn't rain, um, so that all water came from the Nile inundation from, and from irrigation, so that that metaphor of Father Sky and Mother Earth simply wouldn't have worked as well in Egypt as it did in other places. Other people have said, no, it's probably because of the gender of the nouns. In Egyptian, Earth turns out to be a male noun, and Sky turns out to be a female noun, so maybe they were just following the grammar. This is making, making the grammar work in myth. It's also one other explanation is that perhaps it follows what may have been the normal intercourse position for Egyptians with the male underneath the female. And this is borne out by a lot of uh, artwork that we find in, uh, in Egyptian tombs, uh, which shows the male reclining under a female who arches over him. Um, as in so many other myths, the sky and the earth, whatever their genders are, are initially inseparable. She lies on top of him so closely that there's no room for the children to move or for them to receive light. So here their father, Shu, steps in and separates them, pushes the sky away from the earth and separates them in the way that again makes some sense if we remember that Shu is air, that air separates the sky and the earth in the way that the air seems to hold the sky up and keep it away from the earth. Once they're separated, Nut gives birth to the stars, which rise up to be with her. And there's some beautiful details in the story. Each morning she swallows them to keep them safe for the day and then releases them again at night so that they can light the night sky. The sun is born after this separation too, which gives light, and now the creatures have room to move and to breathe. Um, Geb and Nut are parents of the next generation of gods, of Osiris, of Isis, of Seth, and Nephthys. Osiris and Isis are a pair of twins, a boy and a girl. Seth and Nephthys are a pair of twins, a boy and a girl. And then Horus, as we know later on, becomes the child of Isis and Osiris. And this also became part of living pharaonic uh, politics because the living pharaoh was always considered to be Horus, who became Osiris when he died, and Osiris eventually became the Lord of the Dead. So these five, along with the original four gods, Geb, Nut, Shu, and Tefnut, became the Ennead, the Nine, and they became the closest thing we have to a sort of standard um, pantheon in, in Egyptian mythology. There are, however, other creation myths. In one of them, the, the, er, the mud that emerges after this, the Nile flood recedes recedes, gives birth to four male gods and four female gods. The male gods are part frog, the uh, female gods are part serpent, and then the, the eight of them together form a cosmic egg out of which everything is formed. Once again, we have the feeling that this would have been a natural way for the Egyptians to think about creation. As late as the first century, it was still believed in Egypt that when the Nile flood receded, receded that slime, um, which was uncovered by the waters would produce amphibians and reptiles and it was believed that they were spontaneously generated that is the mud produced this, the, these creatures themselves and so um, it would have been perfectly logical to think that these gods who are part amphibian part reptile would have been produced by this slime and then would have emerged to lay the egg which then creates almost everything else 
Um, the, uh, in another version, a third version of uh, an Egyptian creation myth, this one is, is perhaps a later one, and it reminds us of many other stories. The primary god of, of Memphis was named Ta, and Ta was, was considered the supreme god. He was, he was the spirit which emerged out of the original Axis Mundi, and all other gods were seen as aspects of him. All gods and goddesses and all things, everything in the universe, in this case, in this story, is first conceived in Ta's heart and then spoken into existence. He says the words and then things happen. And this is very like the Genesis story, the Hebrew Yahweh, who also creates by thought and, and word. There's not much attention in Egyptian creation stories to the creation of plants and animals and humans. Um, in, in one late account, um, humans are born from the tears of Ra. They're happy tears because Ra has just had his eye returned and, and he's very happy, but they're tears anyway. And some people have thought it sort of metaphorically significant that even in a place as mythically cheerful as, as Egypt was, a place as optimistic about things as Egypt was, that it is, it is touching to think that human beings are created from the tears of a god. Well, that's our, that's our, in our taxonomy, the one that we started off with, this belongs to the category of the breaking up of a primary, primordial unity. It's a gradual process instead of a once and for all creation. And we've seen how this, how this works. We begin with an undifferentiated waste of waters, and out of which emerges Atum, who then stirs up the waters and then makes something happen. His self-generated children, Tefnut and Shu, aren't so much characters as they are simply forces. And this is typical in generations of gods. Usually the original gods are thought more of as natural forces, and later ones are more anthropomorphized, or given personalities and details and stories. Um, they produce Geb and Nut, who are more human, who are more anthropomorphized, but their eternal union still preserves the eternal the, the, the inertness, the, the chaos which, which, from which everything begins. In order for anything to happen, they have to be separated, giving their children room to grow and the sun a chance to become a primary deity. So when Shu forces Geb and Nut apart, that primeval unity is divided into earth, and sky into male and female, each one now has an existence independent of the other. And this turns out to be a key moment in almost every creation myth. It makes possible growth and development and change, but it also leads to the kind of problems that men and women have had ever since. Creation is always a division of primal oneness, a dividing of a whole into parts which can then interact with each other to make human life and culture possible, but which also can lead to a host of problems. The Egyptians were not unique in thinking of this division of male and female in this particular kind of way. The Hebrew Midrash says that Adam was created androgynous and continued to be so until Eve was created, which separates the two genders, and which we know in that story leads immediately to expulsion from Eden and death. The, Greeks, the Greek Hesiod had a story in which the Golden Age in Greece consisted only of men. There were only males during the Golden Age. As soon as Pandora is created and set down among them, pain, disease, heartache, anguish, and death enter the world at that point. Again, the division of the genders is really, is really important in all of these stories. Perhaps all this suggests that without the separation of Geb and Nut, uh, the universe would still be in its undifferentiated state. Nothing could happen, nothing would have happened, nothing will happen. For the Egyptians, this separation is a crucial step in creation. After the separation, the sun emerges. There are various accounts of how this happened. And the sun's progress through the sky becomes the sign of the triumph of order over chaos. Time begins when the sun makes its first journey. It also explains the importance of solar rights for the, for the Egyptians and for other people. For if the sun dies or gets eaten by a dragon, the entire cosmos slips back into the chaos of the primeval world. Time stops and chaos returns again. And as the Egyptians well knew, as all creation myths know, once we're launched on this cosmic voyage, we're launched for better and for worse. Um, we're, we're launched in all of the great ways that characterize creation ever since, but we are also launched 
on a trip that includes famine and disease and aging and death, and there's no going back except going back to primal entropy, which is perhaps what death really is. In our next lecture, we are going to take a look at some neighbors, some very near neighbors of the Egyptians, the people of Mesopotamia in a country which is now Iraq. Um, next time, we'll take a look at their cosmogony and see how, what it has in, in common with and how it differs from that of Egypt. That's our next lecture.